Hey everyone, welcome back to Love Wins. I'm back after a bit of a break. Uh, it wasn't a break really. Uh, my son went off to university, so we were gone for a week doing that. And he is my editor, so we're still working on finding a solution for that issue. Um, me and technology were not really friends. But we are back, and we're glad you're back. And I, I want to talk about something today that's serious. It's not, not a gloomy serious, it's an awareness serious. I want to talk about something that isn't talked about much. Um, and I think it's not talked about because of the lack of awareness. People have gotten to the place where they think that religion is about being right, that following God is about knowing the truth. And, but there's a difference between truth and his truth. There's a difference between following information and following God. There's a difference between believing things and believing him. And speaking of seeing things wrong and awareness, we are living in a world, and I hope you're noticing, that is increasingly struggling with talking to each other, with working things through, with presenting different perspectives with respect, with the assumption that the person you're talking to is intelligent and well-meaning and as reasonable as you are, they just have a different perspective. And it's gotten so bad that if you look at Political debates now, it used to be, political debates used to be about discussing the issues that the nation was facing and discussing how each person would approach those issues so that people could watch and decide which approach they wanted to vote for. But now it's, it's devolved to the place where we're modeling before the nation and before our young people and our children that it's who can insult and lambaste and attack and provoke the other person the most who wins. And this is not mature, it's not good, it's not beneficial, and it's leading our society towards more divisiveness and more hatred. And Jesus warned in Matthew 24, I've talked about it on this channel before, when he warned about the signs of the end of the world, the sign that he warned about more than any other was divisiveness and hatred within the body of Christ. And he said, in spite of all that, some will endure, keep loving till the end in the face of all this. And that the gospel of the kingdom, the, this he said this gospel, the gospel of love in the face of hatred, of respect in the face of division, this gospel will go to the whole world as a witness, and then the end will come. What God wants to demonstrate to the world is that there is a better kingdom, that there's a better way to live and to be, that he's inviting us to rejoin him in his kingdom. But his kingdom is not a kingdom of authority and dominance and dictatorship and power and control. It's not like that. Jesus said to Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen God. So if you want to know what God looks like, you need to look at Jesus. And as strange as it seems, and as strange as it is, there's a lot that passes for Christianity and truth that doesn't really involve Jesus. And a lot of it is actually opposite of who he is in character and in nature. So recently I watched a young woman talk about her journey out of Christianity into atheism. And when she describes her upbringing and the things that happened to her and the things that her church believed, I was like, good, I'm glad you left that. Now I just hope that you find Jesus because what passed for Jesus and what passed for truth in your home and in your upbringing, that's not Jesus. So before we get into this, let me remind you that the greatest enemies of Jesus when he was here was not the world, 
it was the church. That is undeniable. No matter how much you wish it might not be true, no matter how much you might want to defend Christianity in the church, the reality is, and the truth is, when Jesus was here in person, in the flesh, living out God-likeness to us and for us, the church turned on him. They were his primary enemies. Because Jesus was so different, and because what he was offering and presenting was so different from what the church had become, it looked like a threat. It looked like something the church needed to defend itself from, rather than change into. And so the church built up walls of resistance against Jesus, instead of opening up their hearts and their minds to Jesus. But that wasn't the case for everyone. So today, I want to look at John chapter 8. I want to look at a conversation between Jesus and Jews who, at the point of that conversation, were believing in him. Unfortunately, the conversation didn't end that way. Sometimes, we have to be willing to have hard conversations. And in those hard conversations, be willing to acknowledge that we could be the one on the wrong side of the discussion. So the conversation begins in John chapter 8, verse 31. I've shared this message in two different, I have two congregations, and I've shared this message with both of them with some variation between the two messages to mixed reviews. Um, one gentleman actually asked me after if I was trying to get fired. But I feel it's important to talk about these things because the divisiveness that's in the world is creeping into the church and it's not going to become less, it's going to become more. And if we don't learn to consider that we need to let Jesus and his perspective into our lives and our hearts and our minds so that we relate to others in more healthy ways, we're going to get sucked into the vortex of hatred and it's going to eat us up and destroy us. So here's where the conversation begins. John chapter 8, verse 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If, condition, choice, if you abide, remain, stay, in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Too much of religion is staying in the word, the Bible. Some of it's not even that. But better religion is staying in the word. But Jesus makes a distinction between the word and his word. His word is seeing the Bible through the lens of his mind and his heart and his perspective. Which is very different than from looking at it through our own. Because let's, let's be honest. We bring our perspective into everything. So back in John 5, Jesus, speaking to the Jews, to the church, said, you search the scriptures diligently, carefully, methodically, repeatedly, because you think that by doing that, you have eternal life. That if you can memorize it, learn it, know it, believe it right, do it right, get it right, you'll have eternal life. But then Jesus said, but these are they which testify of me. And you missed it. We studied the book, and we missed the point. Jesus is the point. His kingdom is the destination. And neither him nor his kingdom are anything like what we're used to. So when we bring our perspective in, onto the book, we're, we're reading our attitudes and our ideas and our everything into the story. Jesus says, I am the story. You need to let me rewrite the story on your heart. What the Bible says, we have hearts of stone and we need hearts of flesh. Thankfully, he said he's going to give us that. Everything we lack, he's willing to supply if we allow him. So Jesus, speaking to those Jews who believed him, not the ones who were trying to trick him, be against him, not those people, the ones who believed him. If, choice, you abide, remain, stay in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Now, disciples in today's language would be apprentice. It's even that's becoming a less and less used word because we're getting away from the trades. An apprentice slash disciple is somebody who sees somebody who's really good at what they do 
and they say, can I learn from you? And they follow that person, whether it be a mechanic, a carpenter, whatever, and they learn from the master. Jesus says, you can only be my disciples, my apprentices, if you stay, remain in my word. Don't keep trying to suck me into your perspective. You need to come and see it from my perspective. Then he says, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. So truth equals freedom. These people believe in Jesus, but listen to what they say next. They answered him. We are Abraham's descendants. Truth. That's true. We have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Instead of ask, at the very least, if they were going to have a healthy conversation with an open mind towards Jesus, they could have and should have said, what do you mean by that? What, are we, what do you think we're in bondage to? What do we need freedom from? What truths do we need that we don't have? Any or all or more of questions like that would have been healthy and would have opened up a further discussion. But instead, they got defensive. They felt attacked. They felt like Jesus was saying something about them that was uncomfortable and maybe even untrue. So they pushed back and they said something absolutely delusional, which is what fear and pride does to us. It makes us crazy. They said, we've never been in bondage to anyone. The most Anyone who has any knowledge of Israel and Jewish history knows that their story begins in bondage. In Egypt, Pharaoh, let my people go. And that's only one instance. There were many instances after that where they were in slavery or taken over by other nations. And as this conversation is unfolding, there's Roman soldiers passing by in the background. Never been in bondage to anyone? When you feel yourself getting defensive, the, if you can't, if you can't back up, reset, and say, okay, let me calm down. Let me ask a question instead of making a statement. If you can't do that, just say, can we continue this conversation another time? That's better. Anything's better than pushing back and saying something as delusional as what they said. But we're only getting started. It continues. Jesus says, answers them, most assuredly, the most powerful, uh, forceful beginning you can say to anything, to say, what I'm telling you, listen to me, it's true. Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. See, now Jesus, he's not even talking about Egypt or Babylon or the Philistines or any of the other nations that have enslaved Israel in literal bondage. That wasn't, that's not even what he was talking about. So they got defensive against a subject that Jesus wasn't even discussing. Jesus says, if you sin, you're a slave of sin. In other words, if you want to live a certain way, but your desires or impulses or whatever overpower your better reason and cause you to do things that you, in moments of reason and clarity, don't even want to be doing, whether it be addictions, whether it be bad behavior, whether it be the way you speak to people, whatever it is, when you find yourself behaving in ways that you, your better self, doesn't even want to be behaving in, you are a slave. That's what Jesus said. You're a slave. Nothing to do with politics. Nothing to do with empires. You can't even manage your own self. You're not free. Verse 35. And a slave does not abide in the house forever. If you're a slave, you come, they come, they go. 
they're like a tractor. Slave. They're just an implement to make further the cause of the master. But a son, Jesus said, abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. That's the whole Bible story right there. Jesus isn't saying, listen, you're hopeless because you're a slave to sin. He's saying, no, no, no. You just need the son. You are a slave. That's the way it is. That's That shouldn't be news to you. I shouldn't need to prove that. Just look around us. But you don't have to stay a slave. Because if the son, who remains in the house forever by inheritance, if he decides to take you from slavery to freedom, you'll be free. Because the son has that authority. If the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. That this should be a moment of good news and rejoicing. But that's not what happens. 37. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. Remember he started out by saying, if, if, if you stay, remain in my word, you will be my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But as soon as I try and say something that doesn't sound right to you, that doesn't feel right to you, that doesn't, that doesn't come out just the way you think it should be, you react. My word can't even penetrate. It just hits you and bounces off. And then you get mad. And then you want to kill me. 38. I speak what I have seen with my father. And you do what you have seen with your father. Now we could read through the whole thing. I don't know if your attention span can handle that. If it can, then you can go and read it on your own. Let me fast forward to how this encounter ends. Just trying to decide here quickly which part to get to. I'm gonna I'll go to verse 57. Jesus had said, said that Abraham had looked forward to his day, that he saw it, that he was glad. And the people said, Ha, we got him. He's not making sense. Verse 57. The Jews who believed in him said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and you have seen Abraham. And Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. I am. And they knew exactly what he was saying. Then they took up stones to stone him. But Jesus hid himself, went out of the temple, went through the middle of them, and passed by. You can go back and read the middle part of the conversation. Here's the gist of it. Jesus said, I do and I speak what I have seen with my father. I am a reflection of my dad. But you, you're a reflection of your dad. And as the conversation goes on, Jesus tells him flat out straight, the devil is your dad. What does he mean by that? Now here's where it's going to get uncomfortable and some of you are going to shut me off and never listen to me again. It's your choice. I hope it doesn't happen. Jesus said, I do what I've seen with my dad. You do what you have seen with your dad. So the question becomes, what am I seeing on a daily basis? What are you seeing? On a daily basis. If you're bouncing through life, watching the news, not that there's anything wrong with watching the news, that's not my point, follow. If you're bouncing through life, watching the news, watching the people around you, watching the people at work, listening to the trends of society, 
watching television, if you're feeding on the same diet that people who don't even claim to know God or love God are feeding on, what are you seeing? There's a very wise person who wrote once, by beholding, we become changed. Jesus said in this conversation, this hard conversation, that could have gone a lot better had the Jews who believed in him actually been willing to give him the benefit of the doubt, to even entertain and ask questions, but they weren't willing to do that. Truth just bounced off them, and then they attacked. Jesus said, I do what I've seen with my dad. You do what you've seen with your dad. You are, we are, he was, we are, you are, I am, a reflection of what we see. We're, we're replicators of what we take in. That's what we are. And I'm telling you, you might have strong opinions about politics, you might have strong opinions about religion, you might have strong opinions about all kinds of things. But if you're not daily feeding on Jesus, if you're not spending time looking at him, seeing how he interacted with people, seeing how he treated people, seeing how he saw the world, seeing how he treated the world, seeing how he related to the world, seeing how he behaved in difficult situations, seeing how he tried to maneuver people into thinking different ways and better ways, if you're not feeding on him, if you're not seeing him on a daily basis, then what are you seeing? Because what you're seeing is what you will become. And your slavery to sin, which is the selfish, self-absorbed, crazy way to live and see this world, where everybody else is wrong and I'm always right and everybody else is bad and I'm good, delusional, never been in bondage to anyone, I don't have any problems, they have problems. If that's the way we continue to live without letting any of the light that Jesus wants to shed in, in, without seeing our Father in action through the life of Jesus, we will become like our dad, the father of this world, the father of lies, who was a murderer from the beginning. You say, well, I would never, I wouldn't pick up stones to stone my neighbor, never mind Jesus. Maybe not today. But how many people do you think left that day after Jesus disappeared, looked down and saw the stone in their hand and thought, what did I, what was I going to do? What am I thinking? You can talk to lots of people in this world who are in prison, who have done terrible things. And many of them in their same moments will say, I never thought. You can talk to addicts who are, have lost complete control of their lives and they will tell you there was a time in my life where I never thought I would end up here. What are we feeding on? There's a saying in the health world that we are what we eat. And that's very true, medically speaking. But it's also true, psychologically speaking spiritually speaking, emotionally speaking. We are what we take in. And Jesus tried, and he's still trying, to get through our shell, our defensive shell, our we're sure, we're so sure we're right, that you can't be right. Trying to get some light into the darkness. That's why I've encouraged you over and over again on this channel. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm not asking you for anything. I have a full-time job and a very busy life. I don't need to be doing this for me. I'm doing it because I want the light to pierce the darkness. That's why I encourage you over and over. Read Matthew. Read Mark. Read Luke. Read John. You will see someone who's nothing like any of us. You will see someone who has patience for evil people. You will see someone who has grace for broken people. 
you will see, see someone who's willing to have hard conversations, not because he enjoys them, not because he wants the division they cause, but because he knows if he doesn't speak into the darkness, the darkness wins without a contest. Jesus simply said, I didn't come to this world to condemn you. You're already condemned. I came to seek and to save the lost. My question and my challenge for you is, what are you seeing day after day? Because whatever it is, is what you're becoming more of. And I hope it's like Jesus.